Thank you, Robin. Thank you so much, Leslie, for your terrific organization here and for the students and the dean support. This is a great event. And thanks, all of you, for staying all the way through the afternoon session. Sometimes I speak at afternoon sessions and there are five people in the room, so it's nice to see so many of you. Um, it's also nice, I'm going to steal a line I've heard before, our panel is what's standing between you and a cocktail, so we'll try to be interesting and keep you awake until you get to go out and drink a little wine at the reception. So um, Mary Nichols said in her comments today that she thought it was important for us to think about new models of collaborative federalism. And so I'm going to try to take up that challenge and propose a new model. Um, and I'm also going to try to address head on the title of today's symposium, that is federal preemption or state prerogative, by suggesting that um, maybe we ought to have a little of each in at least one policy area on which I'm going to focus. So, um, I'm going to start with the assumption that eventually, although I don't know when, the federal government is going to enact a cap and trade scheme. And there are going to be very interesting questions about the roles uh, that states should play in that cap and trade scheme. Some of those addressed by a previous panel, by Alice. Uh, interesting co um, comments about regional cooperation from Leslie. And so, but I'm going to stay largely away from cap and trade, except that I think that the enactment of a cap and trade scheme um, raises two questions. And I want to focus on those questions. I think they're intimately related with, the, with one another. The first is something we've been talking about all day, but I want to frame it slightly differently. And that is, if we have a cap and trade scheme, what's left to regulate and why? Um, some economists assume that a cap and trade scheme, if it's an economy wide cap and trade scheme, solves our climate regulation problem by um, letting the market, through uh, uh, the allocation of allowances, try to find the lowest cost uh, carbon emissions reductions through a, an elaborate market trading scheme. Um, and that beyond that, we actually shouldn't regulate very much because otherwise you start interfering with those market mechanisms. But I think it's safe to assume that there will be certain areas where we can um, fairly uh, confidently predict that the market isn't going to work. Um, and we know some of those areas, and so let me put a couple out there. So, so what I'm going to suggest is that if there are market failures that we assume won't be adequately addressed by a cap and trade scheme, then we need to regulate. And then I think there's a secondary question that is equally important, secondary only in order, not in import. And that is that if we need to regulate, what level of government ought to be engaged in that regulation? Um, and I think we should examine that question with respect to every policy issue. And that it, what may um, occur through that examination is that um, areas that are of traditional local control really ought to have more federal involvement and vice versa. So I don't want to assume that history ought to determine the appropriate locus of regulatory power. But then instead, we really ought to be thinking broadly and creatively about trying to harness the appropriate level of government for uh, those regulatory activities. So the, uh, there's some obvious areas where I think we can assume that a cap and trade scheme may not send the right, right price signals necessary to get some uh, carbon reduction measures that are uh, likely to prove cost effect effective and important. An obvious area, it seems to me, a number of people have touched on this today, is building standards, where you've got a principal agent problem where those who are building the buildings aren't necessarily paying in the long term for energy costs, and therefore they may make decisions to shortchange energy efficiency uh, for cost purposes up front because, again, they're the ones not bearing the long-term costs of energy or savings from energy efficiency measures being included in the building. Another obvious area, it seems to me, where we're going to need supplementary regulation is in the land use area, where we're making very long-term decisions about what the built environment is going to look like, decisions that aren't likely to be terribly affected by uh, those players in a cap and trade scheme. And so I'm going to assume that we're going to need some level of government to step in and think hard about how to make land use decisions that are going to reduce our overall carbon footprint. Um, and let me give you a third area, and that's the area I'm going to spend time talking to you about today. And that is a really seemingly mundane and boring area, but one that I think has enormous import. And that is appliance standards, efficiency standards for appliances. It seems like a small thing. How, how efficient is your washing machine, for example? But let me tell you why it's so important. So US buildings collectively emit about 10% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Where do those emissions come from? By and large, they come from appliances, broadly defined. So heating, air conditioning, lighting, refrigeration, um, 
uh, electronics usage, and so forth. All of these appliances obviously use electricity in order to be powered, and that electricity, if it's not from a renewable source, which most of it isn't still today, generates greenhouse gas emissions. Um, now, we could solve the problem by moving away from carbon um, based fuels, but we're far from doing that, and it's not clear to me that we're ever going to do it. Um, so in the meantime, I think most people would agree that an effective strategy for reducing greenhouse gas emissions is to improve energy efficiency. That's a pretty uncontroversial proposition. In fact, many of the measures that cities and states have been taking have involved energy efficiency, in part because there are cost savings in addition to um, upfront costs from instituting um, energy efficiency programs. Um, and one of the ways we can do that is through setting appliance standards. So um, let me tell you a little bit about which appliances emit a lot, which have a lot of uh, energy usage, and then how we currently regulate and how we might think about regulating in the future. So um, this, these are rough figures. They change a bit year to year. But on average, Commercial buildings um, use about 36% of their emissions come from either air conditioning or heating, about 9% from the use of electronics, about 7% from refrigeration, 7% from water heating, and close to 30% from lighting. Lighting consumes a huge amount of electricity in this country. In the residential context, air and heat are responsible for more of the electricity usage, about 46%. Water heating is higher as well, 13%. Lighting is a little lower, 13%. Refrigeration is about 8%, and electronics is about 6%. This, these numbers, again, may be slightly different. These are about five years old. And just to give you some perspective, we have about 104 nuclear operating units generating electricity in the United States. That, those 104 nuclear operating units um, generate enough electricity simply to cover lighting in the United States. So. We use a lot of energy, lighting our buildings, heating our buildings, cooling our buildings, and so forth. So how do we currently regulate? Well, since 1978, this is actually slightly complicated. So when we can talk about ceiling and floor preemption, but we've also got some, mod some modifications on preemption. So since 1978, the federal government has largely, although not exclusively, preempted states from regulating appliances. Um, but there's differences depending upon whether federal standards actually exist or not. So if federal standards exist, and they exist for most major appliances, then the federal government will entertain waiver applications from states. But only California submitted a waiver application. It did so in 2006. Uh, for I believe it was for washing machines, and that uh, waiver request, thanks to the Energy uh, uh, Chief Counsel from the Energy Commission, is nodding. Um, and sorry. A, a, an attorney for the Energy co uh, Commission. Um, I'm not going to call you one of his minions. Um, uh, California submitted an application for a waiver. That waiver was denied by the Department of Energy, which is the federal agency that um, controls appliance standards. And the standard for granting a waiver is actually tougher than the standard California has to meet for mobile source exemptions under the Clean Air Act. So this, the language of the Energy Act that established this waiver, waiver um, process requires a state to show that it has unusual and compelling um, state or local energy and water needs that are substantially different in nature or magnitude from the rest of the United States. So what you should glean from that is that it's very difficult to get a federal waiver for appliance standards for major appliances. For appliances where no federal standards exist, States also need to get a waiver, but by and large, the federal government has been generous in granting those waivers. So what we really have in practice is that we have federal standards for major appliances like heaters, air conditioners, water, uh, washing machines, uh, water heaters, and so forth. And we have California or other state standards for smaller appliances like CD players, and my favorite in California for hot tub pumps, which is important here. Um, but by and large, this is a system of federal regulation with a little bit of state regulation um, behind it. And, and um, as with uh, automobile emission standards, California was a leader in issuing stringent appliance standards prior to federal preemption. But unlike the auto context, didn't get its own special exception from the preemption provision.